Hello, hello. So my guest today drives Ernst & Young initiatives and investments in blockchain technology across consulting, audit and tax business lines. He has held a number of leadership positions in the areas of Internet of Things, supply chain and operations and business strategy, working with many client organizations. He led EY first blockchain strategy engagement, examining how digital services, payment and Internet of Things are coming together in new ecosystems and building a strategy and technology roadmap for one of EY major clients. He has 20 years of consulting and strategy experience in mobile and electronics. Prior to EY, Paul worked at IBM and McKinsey, amongst other firms. He's one of the best evangelists this industry has seen, and his opinions are featured everywhere from CNBC, Bloomberg, Forbes, Cointelegraph, or Coindesk. Paul, welcome to the Stakeboard DAO Talks. Thank you very much. I'm uh... I'm delighted to be here and you're hired as my spokesperson with that kind of intro. <laughs> Paul, I'm curious to know, this is a general question I'm asking everyone. Why have you become interested in Bitcoin and how did it happen? So I got interested in, in really blockchain more than Bitcoin uh, generally when I was at IBM and I was, I was tasked with a client question, actually Samsung asked me this question, hey, how do we start to manage large numbers of devices, you know, a, a smart devices, right? That we're, we're entering into an era where lots of our devices are really smart. And I mean, uh, uh, billions of devices, phones, tablets, but even my garage door has Wi-Fi, right? So all these devices are very smart and um, they all use basically a lot of the same underlying technology, have the same kind of smartphone chips in them. And yet strangely, companies spend lots and lots of money managing those devices. Why? Why can't these devices manage themselves? Why can't the garage doors and the refrigerators each kind of serve each other and back each other up? We're, we're making all these smart devices. They sit idle all the time, connected to power and Wi-Fi. Why shouldn't they be managing themselves instead of creating this endless cost for data center infrastructure? So that question got me thinking, hey, we should have uh, scalable distributed computing now, right? It, people have been talking about it forever. And so we started looking at distributed computing solutions. And specifically, we got interested in blockchain because uh, although there are lots of ways to do distributed computing, um, blockchain comes with something very special, which is contracts, accounts, and payments kind of built in. So we said to ourselves, it was funny back then, because this was eight years ago, we were working with Vitalik Buterin on the alpha version of Ethereum for our prototype, we said, we don't know how the Internet of Things is going to be monetized, but we believe that one day it will be monetized and we'll want to have payments and contracts and accounts. So we should use blockchain and Ethereum in particular. So that's how I kind of got sucked into this business. And once you go down that path, it's really hard to come back. And so, of course, I just kept going and going and going. And it got to the point where I really wanted to make it my full time job and blockchain has basically been my full-time job for this will be my seventh year. So, and well, eight years is a lot. Uh, I was curious, why was blockchain more sexy than Bitcoin? So Bitcoin is a, was a really, really cool idea, but uh, I was excited about blockchain more than Bitcoin specifically because I, I liked Ethereum and, and sort of Vitalik and I had a similar idea, which is that um, we can build a world computer. Most of the world's computers are sitting idle. They're underutilized. And so Bitcoin is a very, very cool technology. And it allows you to do, you know, it's the first thing that's ever really allowed you to do secure transaction processing at scale. Right. So Bitcoin is amazing, but it, it doesn't come with this computing infrastructure, this ability to write programs and set up smart contracts. And so when we thought about, hey, what could we do with this technology? The thing that we realized was we want the computing part, not just the money part. Gotcha. So how have you met Vitalik? I didn't really pick him out originally. I one of the great things about working at IBM was I was a VP in charge of an industry group and we had our own industry research team. Mm. And so uh, my industry research team came to me and said, hey, we, we met this guy, Vitalik, right? And uh, he has this idea for how to make it some improvements to Bitcoin that would make it more useful for what we're trying to do. So we worked, the, the first prototype that we built 
was actually a combination of the alpha version of Ethereum, BitTorrent for file sharing, and then Telehash for instant messaging. And a lot of those functions sort of have now rolled into more mature versions of Ethereum. We've got IPFS, we've got uh, mess multiple different messenger services built in, but we realized we need the contracts, we need the accounts, we need the payments, but you didn't want, to, we early on already knew, like you don't want to store like a software update on chain. So BitTorrent is a really powerful tool. So we integrated BitTorrent and then we went to instant messaging because you don't want, let's say, uh, Let's say I have a smartwatch and it's supposed to unlock the, a smart door lock, right? I don't want to wait for a block to complete in order to unlock the door. I need to have instant messaging if I record the different parties in the contract. And so it's really funny. I mean, we were thinking about stuff eight years ago that we're still sort of trying to work on in some respects. And, and we zeroed in early on on a problem that honestly hasn't really been solved yet, which is around the whole like IoT integration. It's not really done well yet, but it got me far enough down this road that it was, it was impossible to turn back. Speaking of uh, the potential of blockchain, in a Forbes India interview in 2019, you said, and I quote, blockchain will be the most boring revolution ever. It's a nice headline, obviously, and the arguments you used back then were sound. I'm curious to know if you revisited the statement in the meantime. Um, do I think, am I going to revisit that statement? No, I, I, I still think in many ways that the payoff, the benefits of blockchain to all of us are, um, are kind of boring, right? Uh, the world spends, if you do the math, the world spends, I want to say, somewhere between three and six percent of global gdp on um we spend three to six percent of global gdp on administration right getting the form a to match with form b matching up your invoice with your payment and the goods received with blockchain and smart contracts and external oracles we can start to match up all of those things automatically and correctly across company boundaries right so uh in in a way like ai seems magical Right. AI seems magical and amazing when you log into something and it suggests something that you, you need. And you're like, whoa, how to figure that out. Right. That that can feel very exciting. Blockchain is going to feel really boring. Stuff's just going to work. Right. You're going to uh, uh, plug your car in and it's going to automatically charge your car. You're going to uh, order parts and automatically the invoice and, and the inventory are going to match up. That's going to be really boring stuff that happens behind the scenes. And so that's why I think blockchain in many ways will be, it's a back office revolution, not a front office revolution. So AI is going to wow people and blockchain is going to be, if it's really, really successful, people will be like, whoa, what's, is there blockchain in that? We don't know. I mean, today, when you go to the ATM machine and you take out cash with your, your, your debit card, people don't think like, wow, that's so cool. There's like a database in there and like TCP IP. <laughs> no one even thinks about that, right? It's like, I got some money finally, right? And it's going to be like that with blockchain, but like stuff arrived, yeah. You know, and we're only going to notice it like supply chains when it's not working. Okay, so it's boring more in terms of the process, not in terms of the effect. Right. No, I think the effects are going to be transformational. And I, I'm a, um, when I sort of think about the really big picture, and you'll forgive me here for being sounding like a really, a little bit of a crazy techno optimist, um, human rights, healthcare, education, right, a shelter, these are kind of luxury goods, right? We, uh, people don't worry about important stuff like healthcare and education and human rights and equality until they've got, uh, you know, a roof over their heads and food on the table. And uh, so making the world better off, right, cutting the amount of money we waste on administration and putting it directly to the benefits, making the world better off moves us towards a world where uh, we can have more of these luxuries like a clean environment healthcare for all. And so uh, I think it's boring as a, as a topic goes, but I think the imp I believe immensely in the value and the impact. And I also believe that blockchain will not only produce a better off world, but it will do so in a way that is fairer than the internet turned out. So the internet was a productivity miracle, but a lot of the gains went to a relatively small percentage of the winners. And I believe blockchain is an ecosystem where it's likely that more of the benefits will be widely distributed amongst all the participants. Is it fair to say that blockchain is pretty much, uh, let's say, uh, an invention or 
a type of technology which is more to the left side of the let's say politics no i don't think so i mean i think technology is is sort of politically agnostic and the truth is at least here in america it's actually uh parts of the far right that are really in love with bitcoin they they love the sort of anti-government manifesto that comes with it um i i am i personally probably am a little bit more towards the left left side of the spectrum but uh I really believe in the value proposition of privacy. I believe tremendously uh, in the idea that um, regulation shouldn't be arbitrary, for example. So uh, I, I think technology is not political, but I think it does matter how you choose to apply it a great deal. Uh, and I think this is a technology that could have some benefits. But I, I will say we should be a little bit skeptical of those kinds of messages because we said all the same things about the internet. It was a decentralized, uh, a public, open network, and yet somehow, by the time we were done, it was really kind of promoting scale of large enterprises and returns to a small number of companies. So, um, technology is politically agnostic, but we have, uh, and 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 I think people generally, history says, we're really really good at getting the productivity benefits out of technology. We're not always really good about making sure that the benefits are widely and fairly distributed. And I think we have to, if we want that to be the case, we have to be, we have to make sort of thoughtful, conscious decisions about how that happens. This leads me to, to my next question, because we have similar backgrounds when it comes to economics and African studies, believe it or not. I'm, <laughs> I'm curious to, I'm curious to know how important is blockchain technology for that part of the world? That's a great question. I, uh, I got interested in African studies at university. I took a class and I thought, well, this is really interesting. So then I took another one, another one. And suddenly my professor was like, you know, you have enough credit to make it a double major. And, <laughs> and that was great. And um, and I thought, you know, this, this is great, but I've, I've been studying this place and I've never actually been. So maybe I should go, right? And I, I found a job uh, sort of combining two of my great interests, which is uh, a, 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 this, this fascinating part of the world and technology. And I went to work for the first mobile network operator in Nigeria, which was an awesome experience. And in that case, what happened was people in Nigeria were literally leapfrogging over the landline system. They, they went directly from, you know, not having a phone in many cases to having a cell phone. Uh, and today, I'm sure I haven't been back in a while, but I'm sure that there are vastly more people with cell phones and smartphones than there are people with landlines in that country and indeed across all of Africa. Um, much of Africa has also missed out on the information technology revolution. So uh, a lot of businesses and government systems don't have modern ERP systems. Uh, many of them don't have any automation at all. And the ones that do, it's often either relatively limited or it's uh, a very old. And so with blockchain, we could see a whole generation of enterprises uh, leapfrog, again, a, probably a generation or two of ERP and enterprise technology. and they will find the kind of uh, integration tools and business tools that are widely available at a fraction of what their global competition paid for the prior generation, which is another kind of technology factor, right? We went through a period, it wasn't uncommon for Western multinationals to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on ERP and tens of millions of dollars connecting up business subsidiaries and business partners, right? A future of blockchain is one where I can probably automate a lot of my core business functions and integrate with a lot of my business partners for a, a tiny fraction of that expense. So it will give uh, uh, businesses in less developed parts of the world, wherever they are, not just in Africa, but also, I just got back from Christmas holiday in Argentina, it's another country that's suffering from uh, uh, some economic challenges. It will give them a much lower cost way to integrate up to each other and to global business partners. In, in an article you published like a I think two days ago uh, on Coindesk, you said, first and foremost, 2022 is all about Ethereum. Just about everything innovative and important happening in the world of blockchain right now is happening in the Ethereum ecosystem. I see three uh, key trends during uh, driving growth in the Ethereum ecosystem in the coming year. And can you please, for the people who will not be, uh, let's say, interested enough to go over the article, just uh, can you summarize these three key trends and tell me if you are an Ethereum maxi? 
I'm not an Ethereum max, an Ethereum maximalist, right? So my because this statement sounds a, like sounds like pretty does, bullish on Ethereum. I'm yeah? a, I am bullish on Ethereum, not because it's the best blockchain, not because it has has uh, the best technology, not for those reasons. I'm bullish on Ethereum because of the lessons we can draw from the history of technology, right? Uh, and and what the history of technology says is that the best technology never actually wins. Right. Uh, we have smartphones, we have desktop computers, none of them run on the best operating systems. Right. And all of us are making PowerPoint presentations or, you know, other types of presentations and they're not done on the best software. And you and I are not having the interview on the best of all possible podcasting software. That's just not how it works. Right. We take at a certain point, the software, or the product gets good enough and enough people use it that it becomes a de facto standard. That's what's happening with Ethereum. Right. And so uh, there are people who come to me all the time and say, Paul, I, I found this, this this way better blockchain. It solves all of Ethereum scalability issues, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. I don't care in the same way that if, if I was going to build a new piece of software, I wouldn't start out by saying, uh, oh, my gosh, what is the best of all possible desktop operating systems? Uh, uh, I'm making it for Windows or Mac be for a very simple reason. That's the systems that have the users. Ethereum is a blockchain ecosystem that has the users, it has the applications, and it has the capital. And this is a network technology, right? Your asset becomes infinitely more valuable by access to customers, users, capital, and other IT systems. So Ethereum has one, they have reached, I believe, escape velocity, right? In terms of moving away from the rest of the pack. And indeed, I was looking at some really fantastic charts, I think something called Electric Capital did the other day, yep. that shows the relative number of Ethereum developers compared to all the others. Right, it's it's head and shoulders by huge margin above the others, and so I'm not an Ethereum maximalist. I'm an Ethereum practicalist. Right, it's the dominant ecosystem. Right, and so I'm going to build stuff for the dominant ecosystem. Uh, and by the way, uh, although I'm not an Ethereum maximalist, I would say uh, it is a very well maturing ecosystem. I I really like what I see about Ethereum. People keep talking about the Ethereum 2.0 ecosystem, as if that's something that's happening in the future. What they're missing is, over the last four or five years, Ethereum has basically managed to deliver a single hard fork every three or four months, right? There's the Ethereum foundation, there's a mature process for submitting improvements, there's a schedule for, for, for process improvements. These, they have committees, talk about boring, right? These are all the hallmarks of a well-managed, institution operating for the public, right? And it looks and feels a lot like the boring committees of the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, right? So Ethereum's got institutional maturity, it's got scale, right? And thanks to the layer two ecosystem that's developing, it's got transaction processing scale as well. So that's what makes me believe that we have reached escape velocity. There's a winning platform now, and indeed, there's a one of my favorite uh, uh, technology history writers is a guy named Horace Dejeu, and he writes a blog called the Simco, and I I love it, and I highly recommend it. He doesn't update it very often, but one of the things he used to do a lot of was look at the history of operating systems, and what you see is that early on in an ecosystem, usually for around the first ten years, there's tons of innovation, there's lots of new systems ideas coming up, but at a certain point, it starts to become clear which systems are going to be the winners, right? And uh, so Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, that kind of thing. And even after the winners are start to be visible, people are still launching new operating systems, right? People are still trying new stuff, but they don't stick. They don't get hold. And so what happens is over time, eventually all those others fade and you end up with one or two winners. We are past the 10 year point in the blockchain ecosystem history. I think we can say based on the huge lead that Ethereum has, that um, uh, the winner is now visible, right? Ethereum is a development ecosystem, right? Layer two is provided with all the scalability, right? Uh, they've got institutional maturity and, and scale. I, I think for those reasons, it's time to declare a winner. I've been ready to sort of do that for quite some time. Um, I, I think it's time to be sort of much more clear about it. If you're not building on the Ethereum ecosystem, you're, uh, I think you're probably making a mistake in my opinion. I'd like to move forward with um, with something that you said again recently, and uh, we took that two minute 
so from the entire video, we took that those two minutes that were interesting for us as Take Bordeaux. I saw and, that. Yes. And uh, you spoke a little about crypto indexes. And I do believe that's an important topic, not only for us, but I think it's important if you could elaborate a little on this, just to give some context, you said that this is really, uh, this is a really big thing I want to see. I want to see passive blockchain Ethereum focused index funds. Tell me more. Yeah. So I think th this comes, so this, this idea comes from some thinking I've been doing every, every now and again, I sit down and I look at my portfolio of stocks and bonds and other things. And I think, okay. How am I supposed to be investing for my retirement, right? Uh, so um, when you look at this, what you see is that Ethereum, in a sense, is a native Ether is a native currency of the Ethereum ecosystem. And in this economic ecosystem, we have hundreds of companies that are being formed. Lots of them right now are financial services companies, exchanges, and 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 uh, stable coins, etc. But we also have uh, um, we have file sharing data storage, yep. uh, content delivery, um, distributed computing, and a business ecosystem is evolving on Ethereum. And I was trying to think about, okay, I want to invest in Ethereum. I want to invest not just in the, the currency, but I want to invest in these companies that are building a new way of doing business in this distributed ecosystem. And uh, I know from my economics undergrad days that index funds, are the most efficient, low risk way to invest in an economy. So therefore, I want the same on Ethereum as I have in the US stock market. And by the way, I, I would extend, I, I would add a couple of other sort of important thoughts to this. Number one, to give the analogy, the US is also an economy. And if I had just bought dollars and did nothing with them, if I just sat them in the account, in my bank account, I would do better than if I had, say, purchased pounds or, or yen, but not that much better, right? But if I'd use those dollars to buy stock in the S&P 500 index, wow, I'd be doing great, right? So, so index funds are much better than just holding the currency. So if we imagine that Ethereum as a global digital economy developed in a kind of similar way, I want to hold stakes in the companies that are being built on top of this ecosystem. That's one really important point. The second point is people tend to assume automatically that if Ethereum becomes dominant, that Ether itself must become extremely valuable. And that is not a certain assumption, right? Uh, the way that, that, you know, unlike Bitcoin, which is a little bit more driven by demand for something that's not used, but is held as potentially like a, um, a hedge against inflation yeah. or intended as a, like a counter cyclical asset, the price of Ethereum is driven a lot by some combination of investment, desire, right, and speculation. But the, the, the value proposition on the investment side is that people buy ETH to use it as transaction fees. But the Ethereum ecosystem is becoming much, much more efficient. We went for a year ago from spending $30, $40, $50 dollars to do Ethereum transactions because of gas fees to spending a couple of cents on Polygon. Right. So the amount of Ethereum gas fees that we actually spend has gone way down because the network has become more efficient. This has made the Ethereum ecosystem stronger, but our demand for Ethereum has actually gone down because we've moved a lot of our high volume transactions onto the Polygon layer, too. So it is not a correct assumption to assume that just because the Ethereum ecosystem as a whole thrives, that the value of ETH, the demand for ETH to burn in transaction fees and gas fees is going to go up. It might not. The, this open like uh like a new territory because right now all the people that were excited about what you said about ethereum being like the winner the alpha male in the room right now they are saying well if the price of the token it's doesn't go up why should i the care price of ETH goes up. exactly exactly it's not going to guarantee and i i think you should still care i think if you're deciding where to invest build implement etc that ecosystem is the right choice. But I think, uh, and I, I will also fully admit that time and again, I have discovered that knowing too much about how the system works get, gets in the way of making good decisions. I got friends who have made a lot more money investing in cryptocurrency than I had, right? They're, they're like, well, Paul, I didn't bother to think about any of that. I just bought a bunch of ETH last year and I made a fortune, you know? 
so uh, I, I don't, don't, no one should ever take investing advice from me. My husband it, it does tech transactions and M&A work. And he once described like a wildly successful, what is now wildly successful major company in Silicon Valley to me when he was working on their seed funding. I was like, wow, that sounds stupid. I'm just, I'm not a venture capitalist. You should no, never, ever take investing advice from me. And I probably way overthink these things. So you, you said uh, recently that uh, you guys, because you are auditors, you are not allowed to own stocks um, because you are not allowed to own stocks of the companies that you are auditing. How far do you think we are from big auditors being asked to look into DAO's treasuries? Uh, weeks. Really? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I have spent much of the last few months briefing our senior leadership on DAOs their implications for uh, how enterprises are going to be formed. DAOs are going to become major EY customers. They're, they really are already are becoming major EY customers. Um, we're going to be auditing DAOs. Uh, we're going to be auditing DAO treasuries. Um, yeah, uh, uh, they're getting legal status. Uh, we're, I don't exactly know how long it's going to take, but my assumption is DAOs are going to be um, one of the, the primary ways in which People choose to form new businesses, right? And by the way, DAOs are going to, um, done well, DAOs are going to pose some really interesting challenges to how traditional companies do business with them because they can be a great deal more transparent. And the first thing that two companies do when they talk to each other is they sign NDAs. I can't sign an NDA with 30,000 governance token holders, right? So by definition, There are chance, the chances are that some of my transactional work with all of these companies is going to be much more public. And we are starting to think through our master services agreements, the legal agreements, the NDAs, how we structure our statements of work. All of those things are going to have to be adjusted in order to work with DAOs. And we have to think about, okay, we make something for a corporation. Um, it's going to get circulated inside the company, but it doesn't get publicly circulated, right? Uh, If you make something for a DAO, there's a good chance that it will effectively become public. So we have to think about what the implications are for the output of our work, work product, right? What happens if somebody takes something, like we could say to a client confidentially, we think this is a dumb idea, right? I, you know, we always try to be more diplomatic than that. Uh, I'm not very good at that part. Um, <laughs> I can remember actually blurting out early on in my career, I was in a meeting with the CEO of a client and he said something and I just blurted out, I think it was my like six months on the job. I was like, that sounds stupid. And the, the partner <laughs> at the time takes me aside and he's like, well, you know, we all think it's a stupid idea too, but that's not what we tell the client. We say it's a suboptimal idea or we think we can improve it. So, but you can imagine, we, we tell a client like, hey, you're thinking about doing something and we don't recommend it. Now imagine if that became public. Right. And the client decided to do it anyway. Right. Would there be lawsuits, investor, shareholder things like, you know, cl clients want advisors to tell them things they don't want to hear. Right. And they don't want to be afraid to hear the truth or to say the truth because it might trigger a lawsuit. Right. And, and sometimes clients have very good reasons for overriding the advice of consultants and, and auditors and so on. Right. They they may disagree with them and they might have very good reasons. After all, we don't always work, know as much about the business as they do. So we just have to think carefully about what are the implications for serving a business where almost everything that you do may become public. Are, are we ready for all these elements of the crypto, let's say, ethos, like decentralization, being your own bank, a trustless future? Because I have the feeling that even us, the people who are staying in this industry many many hours a day we are still having difficulties to understand what are the implications of all these elements but we are dreaming about exponential growth in terms of users and adoption and so on and so forth how do you see this dynamic moving forward between the ethos of the crypto and the new people that will join the party So I wrote another editorial uh, called uh, Web3 is too complicated. And it is, right? We, as we head into kind of the mass adoption era, 
Web3 is still too complicated for most users to use. I personally am strongly against self-custody, uh, mostly because it's really risky. It's difficult, it's complex. Can you imagine somebody losing their life savings because they forgot their password, right? Or they got hacked, right? Which is all too easy. I have been, um, I've been successfully hacked and I lost $17 in ETH and I can live with that, right? Um, but honestly, like, <laughs> Uh, even you know, the auditors, I, I like using, even the auditors are getting hacked yeah. in crypto. <laughs> I, you know, I had a play account. I wasn't being careful. I didn't think about it. And somebody had a really good phishing website. I mean, they just, they got me and, uh, you know, it happens. Right. And if it could happen to me, then it can, it's very easy to happen to other people. Right. And I think, uh, I know, I know so many senior crypto insiders, they've been SIM swapped, they've been hacked, uh, it happens, even if you're very careful. And I don't think people, even those of us who really know this, I don't think we want to spend our days we're terrified that we're going to type the wrong button in or we're going to follow the wrong email, right? I don't want to be a full-time blockchain you know, security expert, right? So uh, I, I, self-custody is something I, for one, don't believe. And I think we've got to make self-custody easy. We've got to make, sorry, we've got to make custody easy, right? And it's got to come with tech support and help and, and fraud protection guarantees that make people unafraid to use their stuff. I think that's incredibly important, right? Uh, secondly, um, we got to make DeFi easier and less terrifying, right, for a lot of people. So, uh, and, and by the way, we also need to make DAOs and other services more transparent. There are good reasons to want more regulation. People knock the regulators all the time, but what the SEC and securities laws have done for Wall Street and investing is really, really positive. You can go onto Yahoo Finance or, or any of these other you know, finance websites and I can compare all kinds of data about a company, right? And there are rules for fair disclosure, right? No insider trading. There are rules for standardization about how certain things are reported and discussed. Those are really important. It makes it possible for me to make good investing decisions. Right now, Blockchain players talk the talk about transparency, but what they're actually doing in many cases is they're creating very complex, transparent, but very complex rules. Rule complexity is a way of favoring insiders. It's a way, it's a form of, it's a very subtle form in a sense of insider preference or insider trading, where you make the rules too, too complicated for outsiders to understand. And then the result of that is that, um, uh, uh, insiders get all the benefits. So I think regulation, standardization uh, will improve transparency, right? And will make it uh, comfortable for trillions of dollars of institutional assets to enter the blockchain ecosystem and for individuals and companies to do so without the fear of losing hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars or life savings or corporate treasuries in hacks and attacks. Speaking of DeFi, I'm curious to know, like, uh, besides like regulation because that's obvious what do we need in DeFi in order to experience significant growth in the next few years so i think it is regulation so the DeFi ecosystem out there if you go and look and i love the DeFi pulse website there are hundreds of DeFi services right and every day there are more and more of these services that offering things like um, uh, uh, DAO administration services, um, uh, index funds, right? There's lots and lots of these services that are maturing. What's holding back institutional capital? The answer is regulatory uncertainty, right? So uh, if I don't know how I'm going to be treated, right? If I'm a pension fund, I have a legal responsibility to invest responsibly for my members, which means a lot of institutional capital isn't going to touch crypto until there's clear regulations, right? There's too much uncertainty around it. So, um, I, you know, you said excluding regulation, but I think regulation is the single most important thing. If once some level of regulation, regulatory certainty comes to this ecosystem, the floodgates will open, right? We're at the beginning of the mass adoption phase. And if you look at the cloud, right? So when the cloud sort of hit its mass adoption phase, which I really think back to, to the, the launch of AWS in 2006, it was simple. It was easy to use. People started using it. We had basically from 20, 2006 till today, we've had more than 15 years of 30 to 50% growth a year. 
That means that the cloud business today is roughly a hundred times the size that it was in 2006. There is no reason to believe that with more regulatory certainty, we have the killer applications. We have, we have DAOs, we have DeFi, we have NFTs. With more regulatory certainty and more comp uh, confidence, there's no reason for me not to believe that 15 years from now, the blockchain ecosystem will similarly be 50 to 100 times its current size, right? That's what happens with 15 years of 30 to 50% annual growth. Think about that. This $2 trillion ecosystem could easily be a couple hundred trillion dollars of assets. It would be larger than the banking system. To your initial, uh, to your initial point regarding the, the technology that wins long term, we can take cloud as an example as well because we, are, we still see Amazon leading the pack. So whoever was like there to, to put the flag and make the product available for uh, even for retail people who, who don't need to understand complicated things regarding cloud, they are still there. And this is this is the other important lesson. I, I really try hard I, I, when I put on my non audit when I put on my consulting hat and I talk to our clients, I try to warn them about the extreme urgency of the situation. A lot of them look around and say, 10% oh, of the population has crypto. Right. 10% of the population was doing e-commerce and 10% of all companies were doing cloud when this thing took off like a rocket. And over and over again, what you see, e-commerce, cloud, networking equipment, uh, desktop operating systems, mobile operating systems, somewhere around the 10% adoption threshold, you go from early adopters to mass adoption. And what's really notable is how rare it is. It's not impossible, it does happen, right? But how rare it is to see a major upset on those early winners. So I, I, I keep trying to impart to my enterprise clients, it's not early days. We are actually, the, one of the, the things I talk about in this recent editorial is we're at the end of the beginning. If, if you are not hmm. in this hmm. business now and, and, and operating with a sense of urgency and people, sometimes other people at EY don't understand why I run around all the time as if my hair is on fire, like shouting about how it's urgent we spend and invest more money and we need more developers and engineers and researchers. It's because I believe we, the window is closing to establish leadership. And I operate with a, an extreme sense of urgency. I want 15 years from now, I want EY's blockchain business, our software auditing, our consulting. I also want it to be 50 to 100 times larger than it is today. And if that happens, we will be probably one of the biggest software companies on earth, right? I, I'm in this game to win it. I don't know if you can answer me this question, but I, I, I'll try because if there is someone who can answer the question that he shouldn't, it's you. So uh, uh, what's, the, what's the atmosphere in, in EY regarding blockchain and crypto in general? Is it more skepticism? Is it more optimism? Uh, it's very, very optimistic. I would say, you know, for a lot of our, uh, uh, a large chunk of our staff, maybe 60 or 70%, right? It's extremely optimistic, right? We have, you know, I keep getting these calls like, Paul, would you stop trying to poach our staff? I'm not poaching the staff, but people are super excited <laughs> to come work in, in blockchain, right? I, I feel a lot of emails from people like, Paul, I really want to uh, 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 join uh, the blockchain team. So there's, there's a huge amount of positivity. Right. There's, there's a huge amount of positivity um, uh, at this, the highest levels of the firm. Right. I think everybody is really proud. I am EY is a partnership and I'm immensely grateful to the other partners who've basically been my venture capitalists and they've allowed us to build a, a very successful business. We don't disclose a lot of data, but I can tell you that well into last year, we passed a hundred million dollar sort of annual run rate uh, uh, for our business. And it, it, it continues to our, our compound annual growth rate, the five year rate is, is around hundred percent. So conclude what you will from that. But uh, <laughs> so they, they've been great investors, right? The business has grown enormously. We are a partnership, right? And we're a partnership in which people are allowed to express their opinions. And there's no question, like we have, We've got people, I got somebody who told me like, Paul, I think this thing is a fad. I was like, and this was like four months ago. He's like, I think it's still a West Coast fad. I'm like, are you kidding me? Right? So there is dissent, there's disagreement, um, but you would expect that in a partnership. And I spend a lot of my time sitting down with other partners, explaining how things are working. 
And I have to respect the fact that we are a partnership, that I can't just impose my will on everybody. But I would say uh, my number one complaint is that it takes us too long to make decisions as a partnership. But I will acknowledge, I must acknowledge that in the end, we always make the right decisions. I have never been turned down for funding. I have never had to let a single researcher go, right? I've never had my budget cut. I felt squeezes, but they've been squeezes to our rate of growth, not to our, our total spend. So is it perfect? No, you know, coming from um, coming from a more corporate environment, I would I would say like overall, I, I'm, I'm happy with the outcome and I've been allowed to build a really great business here. And we have a tremendous, because it's a partnership, when we do make a decision, I would say we have a tremendous level of alignment. And one of the things I'm really proud of is we had some tough battles internally over should we be doing public blockchain versus private and should we just be focused on ethereum right we won those battles we you won't find us developing on hyperledger you won't find us developing on sort of non you know proprietary private blockchains uh we have very you know that was a tough call but as a partnership once we made it we stuck with it right and and that's been very good so uh, there's there's pluses and minuses. There are days when I, I wish that it was more of a corporate top down, but the reality is, is, is that the partnership has worked very well for us. I really, I really hope that other people who are working for the big four will be will be seeing this. Uh... <laughs> I really hope they don't. You shouldn't you shouldn't show this to anybody. <laughs> I don't want you know we're still the only big four firm that's focused on public blockchains. I would like it to stay that way for another two or three years. Okay, we, we will we will keep it as private as possible, <laughs> as a private Thank blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would like to go uh, to go back a little uh, on regulation because I think we are seeing a pretty big mess when it comes to the regulation in the U.S. As in, we are seeing the, the Fed, the SEC, CFTC, OCC, and all these three, four letters institutions that you guys have there. And I'm not sure they know who should regulate what. And it, it, it appears that no one wants to be the referee that decides who is doing what in terms of crypto. And the feeling is that it will take a lot of time. Correct me if I'm wrong. I would say it's actually a little bit the opposite. That everybody wants to be the referee. Um, so you got, you got, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, we have a decentralized system in the US, right? And, and democracy is messy. And a lot of these institutions, they function by appointment. So you've got appointments from the last administration buying with appointments from the, from the current administration. There's a lot of institutional, like in any democracy, there's a lot of institutional machinery. It's not really that much different in Europe. The US gets a lot more attention, but we have a large business in Europe. And I'll tell you, there's, there's a similarly, um, you know, European regulators, the Spanish, Italian, uh, French regulators are, and German regulators are not completely in lockstep either. So uh, in the U.S., you have um, functional regulators and you have some state regulators. In Europe, you have national regulators plus the European level. It It is, by definition, complicated. The U.S. matters in particular just because of the very large size of the U.S. capital markets. Um, I agree it's a little bit messy right now, but I, I believe that that is a natural consequence of very intense focus. People have suddenly woken up to like, whoa, stable coins, really important. People are doing this stuff in large amounts. And $2 trillion in absolute terms is a lot of money relative to the size of the financial markets. It's relatively small. This is a good time for this to be done. Um, I feel, and I don't, I can't tell you why I feel somewhat confident, but I feel somewhat confident that by the end of this year, we'll have more clarity around this kind of thing. And I, I think that will come in part because you have crypto native companies saying very clearly, please regulate me as a bank, right? They're applying for banking licenses. You've got state legislatures that are creating some of the regulatory infrastructure. Um, you know, people talk about the American states as kind of laboratories of democracy. That's a, uh, a, a very useful mechanism for, uh, it's a very useful mechanism for sort of handling, let's say, somewhat competing regulatory back and forth. So I think it'll be a uh, it'll be a productive year. It'll look kind of messy on the outside, but it will be productive. I'm asking because my feeling, or at least my perspective, is that 
there is a strong lobby from the crypto space because we have most of the important VC funds are from the from the US. Speaking of the funds that are investing in crypto, we are also seeing uh, the likes of FTX and so on, CoinDesk and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, I have a feeling that this administration is a little more skeptic when it comes to crypto. Or is it more because we are seeing some loud voices like uh, Senator Warren, uh, like taking the whole stage while uh, we don't know what happens behind closed doors? So I have very strong personal political views, which I'm very careful not to air when I'm wearing my EY hat. So I'll stay away from the political side of things. What I would say is that in politics, right, there's always partisan warfare, right? And if somebody's for something, somebody else is going to be against it, right? That's kind of, I think, to some degree, a bit normal. I can say, having had the opportunity to talk to lots of regulators in the US and Europe, uh, the people who are actually in charge of crafting the regulations are much more reasonable, right? They, they are thoughtful. Um, uh, they are trying to balance out the commercial requirements, the commercial needs. Uh, they are thinking about a bunch of things. They're also thinking about consumer protections. There's no denying that most consumers truthfully do not know what they're buying. They don't understand what NFTs are. They don't really know what it is they're buying. They certainly don't understand uh, almost all of the smart contracts that run in a DeFi ecosystem. Uh, it is... You know, the truth is that most consumers don't probably don't even understand kind of the rules and SEC disclosures and 10Ks and, and many of the, the rules yeah. around the stocks that they buy either for that matter. So um, uh, I'm more optimistic than uh, some, some folks might be. Do you think we already have crypto and blockchain as a geopolitical topic, as in like I'm thinking if someone like Russia or the countries in, uh, let's say, Qatar, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, if they will have a more friendly regulation faster than US, do you think that creates an issue? So regulatory competition is important, but... Uh... There are already places where you can do sort of almost anything you want. And uh, what people always discount is that you've got to actually have a local population that's willing to invest in and, and spend money on this stuff, right? And this is this is a thing that's that's really missing is at the end of the day, most people can't and don't want to do complex cross-border investing. Sure, I can send my money to a very attractive jurisdiction, but it's not easy. And uh, one of the things that makes the U.S. a very big market, even if the regulations are not always clear, is that we have a large population of wealthy consumers who are tech savvy. Same for Europe, same for Australia, right? The local population matters a great deal in terms of the, your willing customers, right? Silicon Valley is full of big companies that are also full of technology people who like to buy advanced technology, right? So if you're going to start a software company for enterprises, Right. If you do it in Silicon Valley, not only do you have access to a lot of great developers, but you have access to a lot of tech savvy customers who want to buy your product and maybe are willing to experiment. So uh, it's not enough just to pass legislation uh, that makes your place an attractive destination. You need to have a population that's willing to invest in it. And if you don't, then you, the government agency, have to be willing to move your procurement onto the blockchain or and you know enable your international banking on the blockchain. You got to do something that creates demand, not just the right conditions. And that's the thing that's always missing is people say, I'm going to pass a very uh, permissive law, but I'm not actually going to do anything to make the market big. And, uh, and, and then you're only doing half the equation. And that's why a lot of these very sort of pro, not just crypto, but any kind of like pro innovation type of, of and, um, legislation doesn't work. And if you look at California, California is a really good example um, of a state that not only wants to have, for example, green energy, but has also passed rules to make green energy a big market here by requiring utilities to have a certain amount of net zero power, by requiring automakers to sell zero emissions vehicles. These things come for a lot of criticism, but they are what makes California a big market for 
renewable energy for electric vehicles. It's not an accident that companies that, that specialize in these technologies are often set up here because it's not just that the regulators are making the place attractive, it's also that they are taking actions to create a sizable local market. I'm sure you've seen the whole Web3 saga on Twitter with Jack, Elon, Mark Andreessen, and all the people from the, the, the crypto community uh, trying to get as close to the truth as possible. Uh, I'm curious to know, do we have a Web3 in the making? And if yes, how is it different from Web2? It's a broad question, I know. Yeah, so this is probably for time reasons has to be our last question. I would say it's a it's a really tough one to answer. Um, these kinds of definitional things, it's a little bit like that going back to the battles of like, is it a blockchain or a distributed ledger? I don't know. We just decided to call it blockchain, right? <laughs> and uh, um, so I, I hate getting stuck into those types of deep definitional questions. What I would say is that um, a distributed computing financial services and business infrastructure is starting to emerge. What I have observed from past big revolutions in technology is that new technology works best when you apply it to new problems. And this is why, at least to some degree, I'm a little bit of a, I'm a little bit of a skeptic about some of the things in the metaverse and the, this sort of virtual reality type of thing, because we already have that and works really well from a centralized uh, system and I'm not sure. I'm not. It's not clear to me what's what's new about uh, decentralized virtual reality experiences that's really different or better than a centralized one. Other than this ability to have like a persistent ownership of an asset, potentially move across ecosystems. Um, I always keep coming back to this question of what is the problem that that we're trying to solve, and and is blockchain or decentralized systems a better way to solve it? And for some things, I think the answer is yes. For some things, I think with the, this uh, uh, metaverse and Web3 discussion, to at least some degree, people are recycling some of the same arguments that we had in the past. I used to hear people say blockchain will replace banking and it will replace credit cards. No, right? DeFi is genuinely new, right? It's not a direct replacement, right? I, I see credit cards in the same way that checks have existed for a long time because of kind of path dependency and inertia and infrastructure. Credit cards banking will, will be very similar. We we don't really replace stuff more often. What we do is kind of add new things on top of it. So when I see all this like Web3 metaverse discussion, the thing I keep coming back to is what is the problem that we're solving, right? And um, how is it additive and what does it do better than existing solutions? Because I, I think um, if it doesn't solve a problem, then uh, that adoption may not be as fast or, or may not ever really come at scale. Yeah, I completely agree because I, I feel that people want from the blockchain revolution, a sort of French revolution that erases everything and builds on completely new ground, which is obviously not only not possible, but also stupid because we built some great things, at least in terms of tech in the last, uh, 20, 30 years. My last question before we end this, because I know uh, you have to join Coindesk as well, is what's the biggest blockchain slash crypto myth that the future will demystify completely? Well, I think uh, for me, my favorite one is just this idea that private blockchains are useful, right? Uh, the only blockchain that's useful is a public blockchain. Um, the only thing that blockchains really do that is genuinely new, different, and useful is the ability to have secure processing of transactions and data without a centralized authority, right? And so when the minute you establish a private blockchain, you've set up a centralized authority, right? If I could agree upon a central authority to run my private blockchain, then I could have just as easily, cheaper, and faster agreed upon a central authority to run a private website. So my... Uh, the one, the, the thing I'm waiting uh, uh, for this market to, to end is the myth that private blockchains have a value proposition. They don't. Before closing on this one, kindly tell everyone where they can find your ideas, your work. 
Uh, I love it if people follow me on Twitter. It stokes my already oversized ego. I'm at P Brody, P B R O D Y on Twitter. And um, I have a regular column in Coindesk. And uh, that those are the easiest places to find me. And if you want to find out about what EY does, you can visit blockchain.ey.com. Paul, thanks a lot. It was fun and interesting. Thank you so much for having me. Great conversation. Have a nice one.